I got sidetracked, okay? I was I was going to review Long Ring Long Land, but uh, I was told to watch G8, and I thought, oh, I don't know about that. I plan to, like, cover all the filler stuff separately, like, on their own. But, I mean, apparently, it's worth watching right now, right after Skypea. And so, you know what? I might have I might have just peeked over, and uh, I ended up watching all of it. <laughs> and, and that's why we're here. It was a little bit of a bump, I'll be honest, because I haven't seen the anime too much. Every now and then I like go over to record like a snippet for the video. But besides that, I haven't seen much of the anime. And one of the things that like took a little bit of a time to get used to, at least for me, was the voice acting. It's kind of weird when you just like don't have any like voices that are attached to these characters. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is this is what you sound like. Okay. But after a little bit, I mean, I, I did get eventually adjusted to it. And by the end of G8, it was fine. Okay, um, so I mentioned that I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to review this or not at the beginning. Because G8 is kind of disconnected from the canon material, right? It's, it's filler content, but it's like good filler content that people wanted me to watch. And so even though it's like disconnected, non-canon material, it was still a situation where I was like, no, 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 tr trust me, just just watch it though. And I mean, that being said, yeah, you're right. Like I went ahead and watched the like first episode of the arc thinking like, oh, I don't know if I'm actually going to review it. And then the first thing we see is just like the going Mary falling out of Skypea directly onto G8. And that's what it immediately clicks. You're like, oh, okay, this is the concept. I get it. I get where we're going with this. And so the whole arc of G8 kind of breaks into two parts. And so part one is like the Going Merry falling on the G8 and the whole crew having to get out of the Going Merry and hide throughout the naval base in an attempt to find a way out. While part two is them officially escaping and realizing that they gotta go back in and steal back their gold. And so, of course, when the ship goes ahead and falls on the Going Merry, there's a ton of spotlights. Nobody planned for this, and everyone's kind of freaking out, like, how did this happen? And it's one of the, like, few times that, like, in this arc especially, we get to see the rare perspective of the Navy, which we don't normally get to see a lot of. There's, um, what's his name? Kobe. There we go. Like, I think the last time we saw a little bit of the perspective of the Navy was, uh, like, Kobe's backstory in uh, the cover pages. But now we, like, really get to see the perspective of the Navy, which feels like, I don't know if you've seen Avatar The Last Airbender, it gives me a lot of, like, Avatar The Last Airbender vibes as you, like, see, um, like, when they get to interact with, like, the Fire Nation. Maybe a little bit of, like, Stormtroopers or... <laughs> Red versus blue. Do people know what that is? But I like that it gives us a lot of perspective into the Navy as they like see this ship and uh, people deem it as like this ghost ship and then they start gossiping about it. And of course, because people think it's a ghost ship and they start gossiping about it, it starts spreading like rumors throughout the Navy. So I think a lot of effort is put in into this arc to showcase, even though it's like a filler arc, to showcase a lot of the personality that goes into the Navy. We get to see, like, the, the general, the admin. I don't know what they're called. Uh, we <laughs> we get to see Fishing Man Jonathan, right? We get to see Jonathan, who's this, like, very uh, calm leader who, like, enjoys fishing, but they're also pretty smart in their attempt to, like, find the straw hats. They uh, were the first ones to understand that, like, oh, maybe the straw hats will try to hide themselves in the crowd. And, like, once they get some intel, they start planning things around and they have, like, their own intricate board. They're one of the few characters that are, like, planning things out. They're like a good Navy Admiral. And they're, like, strategically understanding and planning the next move. Which makes Jonathan feel like a threat to the Straw Hats while also being like this calm character who's like a fan of fishing and like <laughs> doesn't want to eat their vegetables. We also see like Lieutenant Drake who like wants admiration from uh, Jonathan and whenever Jonathan's like, no, you did a good job. You don't need to uh, work more. We can see that like Lieutenant Drake fills with joy as this has been like the first time in a long time that the Navy has actually had to like put in effort to try to stop someone, especially infiltrating their base. We also see like the personality of the Navy in all the cooks as we see like Jessica interacting with all of the chefs. We can see how Jessica has like a more stricter demeanor as she goes ahead and explains the complexity of having to cook like a hundred meals daily. 
And as the crew tries to find a way to leave the Navy base and impersonate the people inside the Navy, we can see that over time, the crew, just like they have done in a lot of their other adventures, starts to just improve the daily life of the people inside the Navy. Jonathan even going so far as to like acknowledge this behavior and being like, yeah, they they got some good parts in them, but we still, you know, we still need to capture them. All right. So how do they impersonate the base, you might ask? I mean, presumably you already watched G8. You, you know. But it's great. They go in teams. You can see character dynamics. We got like Sanji and Luffy's dynamic as we see like Luffy being the, the stereotypical like, oh, carefree, nothing matters. Even when they're like being chased down or when they're hunting him down, we can see that Sanji is always saying like, all right, Luffy, what is your plan? And Luffy is just like out of it. He's just like zoning out. He's distracted. It doesn't really matter, and so Sanji has to be the one to take control of the situation. And so it's up to Sanji to be like, okay, we're gonna impersonate the cooks, and we'll go over to the kitchen. Amazingly enough, this part works wonders. Like, Jessica, the, the chef, explains the complexity, right, of having to cook for 100 uh, people in the Navy. And so as a challenge, they have to cook these meals. And we can see that it's supposed to be like a competition, like master chef level. Oh, you gotta, you gotta cook food faster than us, but also make it better. And so she has like a specific value to her profession. And she just dislikes that Sanji isn't doing anything during this portion of the challenge until the power move occurs where everyone's done cooking. And then Sanji ends up cooking with the scraps. It is an absolute power move to basically understand like Jessica's philosophy in her profession. And then Sanji just one ups that by cooking with the leftover scraps, just like competently and confidently making an amazing dish going from like that confident suave character to like straight up uh, just simp. But I think in G8 specifically, at least both the animation and the voice acting just do so much to propel the character. I mean, even though I'm not that much of a fan of, like, the simp persona that Sanji has going on, when they do it here, it works. <laughs> I love it. And I think this is one of the aspects that just makes G8 shine, is the fact that it has an astonishing amount of good animation. Like when Luffy gets caught for, for for eating all the meatballs, we can see Jonathan stop their hand for a brief second. And when they let it go, there's like a very clean animation as Luffy gets like rubber band whipped with their own hand. Okay, we also have Chopper and Nami's dynamic, which, which like Nami's been my favorite so far. And while I like Chopper, especially their more like innocent, gullible personality, it's interesting to note that Chopper has always been more of a reactionary character. You know, they react to whatever Usopp or Robin says, whether they explain something or they're lying, they always believe them. But so far throughout the story, Chopper hasn't really had a strong motivation to go out and do something besides the primary one in uh, Drum Island, which was to go ahead and study medical science. But besides that, Chopper has been extremely reactive. When they're like in Skypea, they're defending the ship. Even here in G8, everyone goes and has their like little adventure, except for Chopper, who again is very reactionary. They're the one who like stays and camps out in the boat and they don't really do a lot. So it's good to see in like the part one portion of G8, how Chopper gets so much agency as like their profession, they're like one thing that they came here to do to be like an amazing doctor is actually a thing that they're capable of being here. All the other doctors have gone away. The The only other doctor are pa paleontrician, <laughs> pa pediatrician, paneo, you get what I'm saying? Pediatrician. Got it. I was, I was close enough. <laughs> I was practically there. Meanwhile, the only other doctor, the pediatrician uh, at Kobato, who, who is actually there and actually has to take care of uh, everybody else who's like sick or injured uh, in G8, just cannot do it. And so this is Chopper's time to shine as they get so much agency. They grow so much of a backbone. They're like, I don't care if you want to leave me, go for it. I'm not going to leave these people behind. I'm going to help them. 
And that kind of like active agency made me love Chopper just so much more. Maybe Dr. Kobato has like the wrong profession. They might want to be a doctor, but oh, but I don't know. You can't faint in the middle of like a surgery. But we can see that Dr. Kobato has like an amazing personality in G8. Even having like the small mini arc of them being first afraid to even do anything. And because of Chopper and Nami is able to also like grow a backbone, help out the people of G8 and even defend Chopper and Nami, even like going so far as to push back the Navy just so she can keep doing her part of the job. And finally, on Team 3, we got Robin and Usopp's dynamic, which is strong in the sense that they contrast each other so much, as Usopp's main priority is to get the going merry. Meanwhile, Robin has this, like, more strategical approach, where she's, like, planning to scope out the Navy base, planning to, like, infiltrate it, and, as we see later on, take the map. Meanwhile, Usopp's approach is just kind of to wing it. They just kind of go in. <laughs> And it just immediately doesn't work for him. Robin has to, like, help him out so many times. But eventually they go their separate ways and Robin manages to impersonate somebody. Which, can I just say, I came from, like, the manga and I was not expecting to hear, like, bone cracking when Robin does the move. <laughs> It's like, I came from the manga. I was not expecting to hear bone dislocation when Robin does the move. There's a lot of very sweet portions throughout G8 where Usopp and Mecho talk about the Going Mary's repairs. They talk about a person who fixed the ship in Skypea, which I didn't mention back in the review, but clearly Mecho knows something about. And so even though this is like filler content, I want to say that like Oda must have had like some input on this, right? Because it feels like it would be very weird. If one of the Straw Hats mentioned it, it would be weird. But the fact that like Mecco knows something about this means that like, yeah, this is a thing outside of just like Skypea, something that like other people are aware of. And so I think there might have been actual like plans here to kind of interconnect it with the actual canon of the series. Because this feels like a detail that just makes too much sense. Oof. I, okay, I don't know how to say this next part. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna just throw it out there. I think Usopp's lying personality, depending on how it's portrayed, is either like a thing that you can root for or a thing that you can dislike. Like there are some scenes where Usopp just clearly lies about something and nobody believes them. But then here you have good situations where like Usopp gets caught, for example, and they're really scared. They're like, oh, no, please. You got to believe me. I I'm totally a person in the Navy. You got to believe me. And they no one believes them. They're going to lock him up. But the second that Usopp gets a footing, they immediately switch. They go from like this very scared, nervous personality to this overly cocky figure who, who almost overplays the role, who almost just like overdoes it. And if it wasn't for Robin, they would have totally pulled off how cocky they were. And this is one of the things that I started to like about Usopp is the fact that they can leverage their lie into something that makes them more of a threat than they appear. Like later on when Shepard gets thrown into the cell with Usopp and Usopp pretends and starts lying to no Shepard. They are leveraging this lie that they keep creating, which ultimately works out for them because then nobody believes Shepard anymore. All right, speaking of the cell situation, they're they're locked up in a cell. They're also with like Zoro, who doesn't care. They're like, oh, we're fine. The crew's going to get us out of here. It won't really matter. We could actually see like Zoro after the, the break just easily uh, destroy the wooden logs that they're stuck with. It's like they were fine. They were not in a threatful situation, but they were locked in a cell. And so Sanji has to try to break them out and is unable to do so by kicking in the bars. And so their plan is just to use Usopp's dials, <laughs> which for me has created like some of the dumbest moments so far in the series. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
<laughs> it's like, this is so dumb. And yet the humor doesn't take away from the situation. It works. It breaks the cell and they're still able to escape it. Is it dumb? Yes. Does it have a lot of good humor? Yes. And does it work? Absolutely. And this arc has a lot of humor that just goes hard. Like Chopper later on uh, it starts threatening everyone that they're going to like do some really bad stuff if you don't let them escape. Zoro is like hyping up Chopper as this like extremely threatening villain. But Jonathan just uh, lets him escape. They're like relatively calm when, when they go ahead and escape for the first time because they're aware that they have all the gold. Jonathan's playing like a 4D chess where they're like, oh yeah, they can escape because in the end, they're going to have to come back here anyways. I think Jonathan just works amazingly well from a, uh, from like a narrative perspective, as we can see, they have a lot of symbolism with both chess and fishing as they're like able to like toss in bait and reel them in and let them back a little bit along with that, like very calm personality to reflect that. And ultimately, they're right. Nami wants to break back in. They want that gold. And everyone's like, oh, I don't know. We don't really need the gold. And Nami does an amazing job just trying to convince everybody. Like, no, no, no. We should go in there and get that gold back. Ultimately, leading up to the fact that they should use that gold to fix the going merry. Which is where you get, like, a really sweet scene of seeing all of the adventures that they've gone on so far with the going merry. But it's been like 300 chapters that we've had the Going Merry with. For like the people who like been reading it since the beginning. It must have been like what? Four? Five years that they've just like seen the Going Merry <laughs> get utterly destroyed? And even for me on this like three month adventure so far. You start to see the Going Merry as like one of the crew members. And we see that like the crew members are injured and they get patched up. And so too does the Going Merry get injured and hopefully get patched up. So they break back in and things are a little bit different, right? Now Shepard's actually in control and he's got to try to take him out. Shepard like pulls out a bazooka, which could feel uh, very disconnected, especially because they're like, oh, this is like the best bazooka. This could like take out an entire uh, d d city or something, which could have felt very disconnected from the rest of the series, at least for me. Until we see that it's, again, played as, like, this comedic thing. So it's played, like, as a cartoony joke. And the fact that it's played as a cartoony joke makes it work better for me. The fact that it's like, okay, even though this is happening, the stakes are low. Let's be honest. And so, ultimately, like, even though it's this, like, bazooka situation, the crew is still able to leave. And Shepard is pretty upset. And so is, like, a lot of uh, the commanders in the Navy. They're like, why don't you stop the ship? And Jonathan just waits there as we see that the sea just, like, drains at 11 p.m. And again, we see, like, Jonathan playing, like, 4D chess the whole time. This is why they're calm. You threw out the bait, you reeled them in, you let them go, and now you trapped them. Like, it had worked surprisingly well if it wasn't for, you know, the last part. Because ultimately, I love that this filler arc managed to round out the arc by completely just reconnecting it to the end of Skypea. It, like, reuses the impact dials, which, by the way, look incredibly painful. Like, imagine how much force you would need to lift up a ship. But you reuse the impact dials and you start reusing the, the balloon squid, which starts setting itself up to reconnect back up to the start of Long Ring Long Land. It's like one of those like short and sweet filler arcs that I would probably rewatch. Oh, the next one's gonna kill me. It's long, long ring, long ring, long land, long ring. That's a tongue twister. How do you say, try saying that three times fast, huh? Go for it, long ring, long land. You can't, don't even try. I know you got it wrong. See, you messed, the, you messed up the second one, didn't you? Don't lie to me. It's hard, ain't it? 